Hello, everybody. So, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our fifth colloquium speaker and our third sort of out of uh, Tucson speaker uh, today. This is uh, Professor Douglas Shepard uh, from the university, or from Arizona State University. Um, so, Doug is currently the uh, Scilog Advanced Bioimaging Fellow and directs the uh, Quantitative Imaging and uh, Inference Lab at ASU. Um, so prior to joining ASU, he was Assistant Professor um, in the Department of Physics and Pharmacology at the University of Colorado um, in the medical uh, school up there. Um, and prior to that, he got his PhD in Physics at Colorado State University. He was also a postdoc fellow in the Center of Nanotechnology at Los Alamos. Um, before that, he grew up in New Mexico, actually spent some time um, in Santa Barbara as a uh, PhD student uh, or as an undergraduate. And in between the two, um, and for some of you who are um, familiar with the terrain in Colorado and New Mexico and Los Alamos, you might not be surprised to hear that uh, he is a self-proclaimed uh, recovering alpinist. In fact, uh, Doug spent a long time um, uh, you know, wandering Patagonia and Alaska and certain parts of the United States um, as a ninja alpinist. And uh, he was even sponsored by Mammoth for a good part of that time. In fact, up until he became a professor at Colorado State. So um, if, you have interesting, if you have questions about alpinism, uh, you might want to join Doug and I for dinner. Uh, we've been shop talking a little bit about that. Um, however, today we're going to learn about uh, Doug's uh, current work in uh, a, an optical microscopy. So uh, the focus of the QI2 lab is to develop quantitative imaging and statistical inference tools um, for building a quantitative understanding of how cells organize into tissues and organs. Uh, so today he's going to talk about scalable high-speed uh, 3D imaging of molecular biology in action. So thank you very much, Doug. Great, thanks. So I don't know, there was some discussion about should I take my mask off? Is it easier for people to understand me if I take this off? Okay. All right. So, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I actually have been looking forward to, to trying to come down here since I, I came to Arizona. Uh, and so, you know, my lab kind of works in a mix of areas. We were, because I was at a medical school, we're a bit half molecular biology, and a big reason for the move to come back to a, a pure physics department and go to Arizona State was we had some ideas about, about how to do this kind of nanoscale molecular bio image, biological imaging a little bit faster and in a little bit different way. And one thing we really try and do is we do try and think really carefully about the model of the, the microscope itself. And so given this is the optical sciences colloquium, I mainly focus on that for the talk. But I, I do want to give a little bit of just a hint of biological motivation. And then, we'll, and then we'll get to the sort of light going through lenses and, and mirrors. So, when I started learning about biology, one thing that enticed me as someone with a condensed matter physics background was when you think about a biological system, one way you can think about it, and this is a bit of a reductionist view, is that you have some inputs and then you have an output. And so if we had a deterministic input, let's say you raise the temperature on a bunch of cells, right, or I start raising the temperature in here, then, then you know, there might be one outcome, which is everyone decides to leave, right? In cells, it might be they turn on a stress signaling pathway. Right, they're going to try and respond to it. However, evolutionary, what you often see is you put that input in and actually you get a variety of outputs. And so not all the cells respond in the same way. So there's something that's evolved over time to make the signaling networks have a variety. Also, you can see they buffer sometimes. And so a wide variety of inputs go in. And often this behavior is just described as stochastic or random. And people just say you should give up all hope on understanding the way that biology works at this level. So... What was interesting is when I started working on this was about when a set of tools came out to actually probe the actual molecular contents, like let's say count the number of RNA in every cell using both imaging and molecular biology techniques. And so, you know, you could start to ask, well, can I do a better job? And can I ask, you know, what is actually controlling this? And one thing you could say is maybe I just didn't measure enough. And so in this particular case, what I've plotted here is data from Arjun Raj's lab uh, at Penn. And throughout this talk, I'm going to refer to RNA, 
there's not going to be any networking pathways today. I hope everyone knows what RNA is, especially with the COVID-19 going on at the moment. So this is DNA goes to RNA goes to protein is the central dogma of molecular biology. When I say RNA here, what I mean is what's called an RNA transcript. So this is one realization of the gene making a copy of an RNA. That's what the cell uses to then make a protein. So this is a distribute, each one of these dots is a cell. So like this cell had 6,000 copies of this uh, gene. And then you can see they actually kind of fall along a line. And here all the things are noted, what phase of the cell cycle these are in. So cells have a lifespan in which they do lots of things. But actually you can see the thing that explains this spread is just the volume of the cell. So if you did a measurement where you could measure the volume of the cell, now all of a sudden I actually have two outputs. And, and suddenly this stochastic, seemingly random behavior makes a lot more sense. And so if we can start trying to scale up and think carefully about you know, what it is we should be measuring and then measuring more of the right thing, we actually maybe have a chance to start to understand some of this behavior. So lots of people are working on the molecular biology of this, and I just pulled some examples from friends of mine. So this is from Tim, Tim Stasevich's lab at uh, Colorado State University. So all of these different colors, this is a living cell, are RNA and protein that are floating around interacting with each other. And then each one of these dots is a diffraction limited spot which should map the point spread function of a microscope. So you can actually look, I mean there's a lot of information here, right? We can actually track these things moving around and ask questions. So we could say, well, the thing we're missing is do we not understand spatially stochastic chemical reactions? Does things just run into each other? The, you know, what, I, what my group has worked on is working on fixed cells, which means they're dead. And then what we do is we image a bunch of cells at, say, zero minutes, a bunch of cells at 10 minutes. These are two different populations of cells. The red dots here are one type of RNA. The green dots are a different type of RNA, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And you could ask, well, if some cells turn on and some don't, maybe there's some evolutionary population bet hedging. Like, the, it's evolved so that it, you know, it costs less to not respond to a stimuli. And so if the stimuli was fake, then those cells will live longer. Right, because they didn't expend the energy to respond to a, a fake stimulus. So let's say you raise the temperature for one minute and then drop it back down. If all the cells respond, they all spent a lot of energy. So we worked really carefully on this. this is in yeast. And so this is this uh, paper that came out in 2019 here. And what we figured out is that if you actually pair this with really careful statistical models, you can actually predict what the populations are going to do as a whole. But what you need is a very good count of these dots per cell. And so what does that look like? That looks like this, where you've got this gene, this gene, this gene, this gene, this gene, this gene, and then you have to count those per cell. So you actually need to design a microscope that is both fast enough and high enough resolution that you can go in and localize each of these diffraction-limited puncta, which again are a fluorescent imaging way of imaging these. I'm not going to get too much into biochemistry. And so I hope you can appreciate this starts to become a lot of data, right? Like you have to do a lot of imaging, and so having something that's both high throughput and high fidelity, you know, is, is what we really need. So this is a, a larger field of view image of all those RNA. So here's a cell. Green is one type of RNA. Orange is another type of RNA. So a lot of what we work on is let's try and identify a model. Let's then fit and predict that to our distributions of data. We'll pair that with the image analysis, and then we have this iterative process by which we try and put the two things together. So this is a statistical inference. So uh, how many people have seen Bayes' theorem? A few. So this is a way to think about how to fit models and data together. So the, what we measure in, in the, is data. Then we have some sort of model, which typically we call the likelihood. We have some prior knowledge about what we thought we knew. There's a normalization constant. And then, then this posterior value tells us, like, you know, how confident are we that this, this modeling situation that we've set up actually matches our data. So this is actually called the inverse problem. So it's not a forward model, right? I'm positing a model. I'm asking how well does the data, how well is the data explained by that, and then I'm iterating to try and figure it out. So this inverse problem is actually a major goal of people who broadly work in this world of quantitative biology, right? Solving this inverse problem, coming up with good models that have the right structure, and then coming up with good data to match those models. What is often not included is the response of the measurement. So when you work with biologists, and particularly when you work in low signal to noise regimes or counting single molecules like we work on, it turns out the measurement actually can significantly skew the results that you get out of it. So if you count a molecule you shouldn't have counted, you count a trajectory incorrectly, you don't measure enough cells, these all actually massively can skew this process of the inverse problem. 
And so what I want to focus on in the talk today is our efforts to think really carefully about, you know, what is the response to that measurement and how do we improve it on the optics side. So I'm going to start to leave the molecular biology behind here, but I want to give you one motivating example of a colleague of mine that came to me with a problem. So Frankie is a graduate student that's about to graduate from uh, my colleague Rizal Harardi's lab. And there's this famous paper called Life at Low Reynolds Number in the physics community, which is the way things, you know, nanoscale objects interact with their fluid is very interesting. And so this is a paper by Purcell. And what he posited is for something that looks like a flagella, which is the corkscrew thing that helps bacteria move, you actually can infer something about the forces that are acting on this flagella if you can get its precession rate and its velocity that's moving in a direction. So Rizal actually made fluorescent flagella, and then Frankie started working with them. And so when you just measure this under a high numerical aperture, wide field microscope, all right, let me make it repeat again. This is what you get. And I think, you know, so you can see it wiggle, but I hope everyone can appreciate it. it goes out of focus a little bit, and we don't have any way of getting this precession angle, right? We don't have any three-dimensional information. So this would be an example where you could try and infer these rate parameters from this data. It looks pretty good, but actually you're going to be completely wrong, right? You've missed a large part of what the measurement is hiding from you, which is this three-dimensional information. So what is, you know, how does a microscope work? And hopefully some of this is, you know, a bit of a review. Um, so if we have an imaging system and we have these three dots and we have a set of lenses that make up an imaging system, if we had a perfect aberration-free 3D imaging system into two different refractive indices, what would happen is each of these three dots would then get mapped into the correct place and all of the rays would come back together without an aberration. Okay, so what are most high-resolution optical microscopes that work at the nanoscale? Well, for this to work, the magnification has to be the ratio of the refractive indices for this to hold true, this type of imaging situation. So I'll tell you the typical uh, magnification we work at is 60 to 100 times. And here's what the refractive index of water. So we should have a 1.3 magnification. We actually have 60 to 100. So we don't have perfect 3D imaging. But we have most microscopes, again, fluorescence microscopes, Instead, attempt just to form this high-quality planar image where the sign condition is satisfied, which is to say there is a plane here where the light is put back together correctly. And so this is known as the sign condition. And so this is if you grab a microscope from Olympus or Zeiss or, you know, anybody else or one we normally build in our lab, this is where you would put the camera and you would get a high-quality image in that plane. If you tried to displace off that plane, your objects are going to be stretched out. And so you know, what are these objects? So often they're incoherent emitters, and I just want to make this note so we're all clear I'm not talking about coherent imaging in the, most of this talk. So typically they're an organic dye, so these little dots I was showing. They're an organic dye, they're a fluorescent protein, or they're a fluorescent nanocrystal. They have some spectra, so the dash here is the emission, I'm sorry, the absorption. Solid is the emission for three different molecular dyes. And, you know, this is often you know, what we're thinking about. And just to remind everybody, we're in the incoherent case, right? So we, we don't have any of the phase information anymore. That phase information is lost when we do this. And so we gain some things because of this, but we lose some things because of it. But it's just important for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about incoherent imaging. I'm not talking about coherent imaging. Okay, so if we think about what is this single dot from, you know, we have some emitter that's small, let's say this one nanometer die, and we're going to take it as a, a perfect point emitter. So then that's going to get focused down by the microscope, and we're going to have some function that describes what this looks like. This is called the point spread function of the microscope, and this has some finite width, right, due to the fact that microscopes are band-limited imaging tools. We lose high-frequency high information, and so we, can't, we don't have a delta function here, right? We have some finite width that describes what this looks like in this lateral imaging plane. The thing that has happened is there's been a rush for resolution in molecular biology. So the Nobel Prize was given out a few years ago for super resolution. Actually, we were talking about this over lunch. And there's been a rush to say, I know where this molecule is with this much precision. But often when we're talking about objects like that helix I showed you, that's not one dot, right? That's a continuous object, which means there's a continuous range of spatial frequencies that we care about. 
So what the race for super resolution has done is it's taken the problem a bit away from the fact that continuous objects have some variety of spatial frequencies and the transfer function is actually what really matters here. So understanding what the transfer function of our microscope, you know, this is going to help us more. So maybe we have, you, know, you could build two different versions of some single molecule scope, A and B. They're both going to have the same ultimately limiting max spatial frequency, but you're going to have very different transfer functions depending on how you decide to go about that. And so this is what that would look like, you know, in 3D. And so there's this thing called the missing cone, which I'll come back to. So the thing I want to emphasize for the truly quantitative way, you know, how do you think about this, is that all of these transfer, all of the final transfer function actually depends on all the components. And I just want to give you a quick example from the point of view of what does a camera do to the system. So let's say we just have the optics. What I've done here is I've simulated uh, fluorescent molecules that are under the diffraction limit that have no, no, no Poisson noise, no nothing. There's no camera. There's no camera noise here. So then if we add in a camera with half an electron volt of read noise, here's what the histogram of this looks like. So actually you can see we can still resolve the Poisson peaks that are around individual photons. So actually this camera does exist now. Hamamatsu just released this camera. It's called the QCMOS. And there actually now exist fluorescent imaging cameras that have under an electron of read noise, and you can actually resolve the photons on the detector. But most cameras look like this. So we actually have no idea, you know, very concretely, this is all, all those individual peaks we saw in the last one that correspond to, you know, zero photons above. So here's the noise floor, right? Zero photons, one photon, two. So now everything's blurred together, right? And so typically we need some sort of statistical model to estimate the number of photons that are underneath there as well. So it's just important to, to think about that. Even if you do the optics correctly, you can kind of ruin it. And the last thing I want to say on just like the introductory part is that just to remind everybody about the diffraction limit, if we do have some object that's diameter is much, much less than the wavelength of light, it's going to appear as an airy disk, right? If we have objects that are about the wavelength of light, it's going to appear as a slightly blurred airy disk. If we have some continuous object, then you know, we can see most of it. And so this is another realization of that transfer function. So how do people do better in terms of this localization I mentioned? So they exploit some sort of nonlinearity. So this is, again, this Nobel Prize I mentioned. Um, Eric Betzik, Stefan Helen, and W.E. Morner were awarded this for super resolution and single molecule imaging. So if we think about some object, which is this yellow object, and then we're going to image it, then we're going to get some blurry thing. Because remember, the point spread function blurs. All these transfer functions change everything. So Stefan's Hell group is, is who introduced this idea of STED. So what they do is they use a donut beam. That donut beam makes everything inside that undergo stimulated emission. There's no photons from there. You then raster this back and forth, and you get something that looks closer to the actual object. So the nonlinearity here is the transition into the stimulated emission. Photo switching, which are single molecule localization microscopy, the nonlinearity is that what you do is you turn all of the fluorescent labels off and then you randomly have them turn on one by one. And so there's two variations on this. There's a version of SIM and then Storm and Palm. So all of these take repetitive images somehow. This one you need to scan your spot across the sample. These two you need something like hundreds to thousands of images to hope that everything turns on random, you know, enough to see it. The other way people have been exploiting, and we had some com com conversations today about deep learning, is there's been a lot of work on computational predictions of out-of-band information, right? Let's train a deep learning network. So I really like this review paper that, or this commentary that just came out. So, you know, people have been trying to basically upscale their fluorescence images. So here we have a blurry cell. You train it on some, you know, data set. You generate a convolutional neural network. You then estimate some high resolution that has beyond the traditional diffraction limit, so it's got out-of-band information. But, you know, if we took a blurry picture of a cat that happened to have these same things, it turns out, you know, maybe it's going to predict that it has this nucleus inside of it as well, right? And so I, I actually am a believer in, in restoration and other things with, with deep learning, but I do think, you know, in this commentary they go even further and they show what happens if you take a network train with like squares, circles, various size rectangles and triangles and then try and do combinations of predictions. It's going to predict triangles when you should have squares, squares when you have circles. So there's promises and perils here, right? And so what we really got focused on about two years ago was this method called structured illumination, which is a question of how do we access out-of-band spatial frequency information without the nonlinearity? 
And so I'm going to walk you through how this method works. So here we have the 2D representation of the optical transfer function. So I guess the, the kx and ky got lost here. And so there's also this idea of what's called a moray pattern. So if we take some sample that has one frequency of information, we then pose a pattern on top of that that has another frequency, we're going to get a resulting third frequency that's a combination of the two frequencies of those patterns. So it turns out that you can do this on a microscope by generating a standing wave at your sample. And you can do this by re-interfering two laser beams. And so if you do that, and you do it correctly, what you can actually get is you can get information from outside your K-max, which again is this dark black circle, will actually be down-mixed into here because it will show up as this pattern, which is something you can detect. The actual thing you're detecting is these two sets of extra transfer function regions which are centered around the frequency of your pattern. So I'm going to show you a more concrete example of this. This can be a bit abstract the first time you see it. If you then change the angle a bunch, you can fill in a, 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 you know, a much more full transfer function. So in the linear regime, this works out to getting you twice the k-max. You can get twice the resolution. So what does this actually look like? So here's some image of a biological sample in fluorescence. And then, I don't know if people can see, there's these very faint pieces of information here. And then, actually, so let me back up. This is the Fourier transform of a biological sample. So this is a cell that has been imaged that then has the Fourier transform. And then in this Fourier transform, you can see these two symmetric peaks. And so if we actually start looking at what all these are, what it is is here's that center piece of the optical transfer function. So again, we're in reciprocal space. And then in these little areas here, there's actually this extra information that's contained in each of these ones. And so your goal is to then try and put that all back together to get this comprehensive piece in reciprocal space, which you can then take the inverse Fourier transform of and then get it to work. And so then when you do that, you can get a, high resolution, a higher resolution version of your cell that has information out to these areas. So what does this look like? So the data is described as your actual object times your pattern convolved with your point spread function plus some noise. And then the pattern itself is some cosine. You know, you can describe this as some sinusoidal function with, a, with an amplitude. So the key parameters here are this modulation depth. This tells you how deep the cosine is. And then this noise term is becoming incredibly critical, and I'm going to come back to that. So when you go through a lot of math, you end up with this as your representation of the object in reciprocal space. I'm not going to go through this. I'm happy to go through it in detail afterwards. And what I want to point out is that this noise term is critical. So what I have plotted here is incre or, let's see, increasing signal to noise and then different modulation depths of the pattern. So the orange is a worse modulation depth than, than the purple here. And what each of these are is there's actually two lines here. This line is separated by th roughly 330 nanometers, and then we go down by 30 nanometers every time. So this is a simulation. I'm going to show you the data associated with a target that actually looks like this in a second. And so here... This peak corresponds to this line, uh, sorry, this line. And then you can see in the blue, we start to be able to resolve peaks faster than we can in the orange because there's a higher signal to noise. And so the, the point I'm trying to make with this slide, if you don't take anything else away from it, is that because there's this noise term here, and because we're doing all this information estimation in reciprocal space, where does noise show up? Noise shows up as a high frequency component which means we're going to have error, more errors show up in these higher frequency components than we will in the central frequency you would normally have. So when you go to do the computational reconstruction, your ability to tell two closely placed things apart is really, really dependent on the signal to noise of the images that you generate. So then this again is something that comes down to like what is your camera doing and how is the model working and how well do you understand the transfer function of the system to start with. So are there any, I know this is a, a bit sort of you know, I usually don't show too many equations, so this will just be sort of one of like five. Are there any questions at this point about this? Between the, the purple and yellow, what kind of signal-to-noise are you seeing? So the signal-to-noise is in uh, for each of these is actually the same as the modulation depth of the pattern. That's different between the two. So in this case, the signal-to-noise is the same for all of them. In this case, the signal-to-noise is the same for the fluorescence signal. It's the modulation depth of the pattern that changes as we go along. Yes, correct, and that is a very strong assumption that we think gets violated quite often, and I don't have a great answer on how to fix that at the moment. <laughs> Was there another question? 
Yeah, it's it's flat. Yeah, so it's it's white noise. So there's there's some questions about is it actually flat or not, and this is a whole problem that people are dealing with. So how do you normally make these patterns? <laughs> so the original uh, proposal was a physical grading, and then this physical grading was either displaced or rotated to change the way the pattern was oriented or the phase, and then you block the central order and you recombine two beams at the sample, so you get a sinusoidal pattern. So what's the advantage of this? You get very high modulation depths. Right? You have very, very light efficient because it's transmission, but it's very slow. And you also need different gratings for different wavelengths. So the old Zeiss instruments actually physically shift the grating when they move between the original ones. People have gotten smarter about this, but this is it. So because of this, um, Mats Gustafsson's group, who really is the person who pioneered a lot of this, came up with an idea about how to use a spatial light modulator, because here you can on the fly change the pattern size to match your wavelength. And so this is just an example of one of their first elements. The one thing I'll point out is when you do this, you have to be very careful about controlling the polarization after you come off of it. Because if you don't control the polarization, you will ruin the resulting re um, modulation depth when you recombine the beams if the polarization is not carefully controlled. So you can generate high modulation depth. For old spatial light modulators, you threw away half the light, right, because you had to come in polarized. Um, you can program the patterns. They have a relatively slow update and a relatively small chip size. So why do we even get involved in this field? It seems like it's quite robust and it seems like it's working really well. So the rates here are actually quite slow. I mean, you're talking like in the order of hertz to build these images. And so one of the questions we had is can we go faster? And so a postdoc, Peter Brown, joined my lab who had experience with these digital micromirror devices. So I don't know if anyone's ever seen these. So I borrowed this animation off the Texas Instrument website. So these are machined arrays of mirrors and the way that we use it is that the mirror, actually each individual mirror can tilt into an on or an off state. I'm not sure if it's, there we go, it's still playing. So here's the mirrors. They have these flexible torsion hinges and then what you can do is pivot them. And so there are a lot of people who have thought about how to use these when they're dealing with sort of one wavelength. But because of this pivoting action that they have, it turns out that they have some very strange physics when you try and use them for multiple wavelengths of light. Let me just make sure that this, it looks like it might have froze up. That's okay, the next slide explains it a bit better. So the diffraction grading gives discrete output orders, but then the micromirror shape itself gives a sinusoidal envelope on that. And so if we think about what that looks like, what we have is the incoming light will bounce off this grating, some light will go in the off direction, and then you'll have a bunch of orders in the on direction and you'll have an envelope on top of that. This is different for every wavelength. And so no one had really figured out a way to properly do a forward model to ask, like, how should I configure the entire experimental system to run this in a polychromatic situation? So it turns out this hadn't been done to figure out how to recombine the patterns with high fidelity. And actually, I'm not sure why this group hadn't quite finished their calculation. It, it wasn't, they did this horrible brute force numerical thing where they needed like three GPUs to try and simulate it. it turns out, so, we kind of looked at this and we thought about it and Peter thought about how to simulate this whole thing and it turns out it's actually possible. And what I want to point out is that you can go to our GitHub and you can download this code and it runs. And so for any situation you're interested in, you can simulate how a DMD will generate any, what the light will look like for any pattern coming off of it. And so, and then actually we can take that and then actually forward propagate it all the way to the sample plane. And we can tell you what it should look like. And then the thing is we can actually then tell you what it should look like at the camera which means now we have a complete model of the system, right? So we actually have this forward model that completely specifies how these patterns should show up when you end up back at the camera. Let's say you're imaging just a uniform die slide, right? Then you should see this. And so Peter did a really good job with this. And so what that allowed him to do was simulate as a function of the um, spacing of the unit cells of the system. And I'll, I'll come back in a second, but what you can think about this is the input angles that you're coming in with the light at of where can everything be aligned so that you can either use four colors or you can use three colors. The one thing I will say is this black line is if you're coming into the DMD at 45 degrees, this turns out to have some advantages experimentally. So what he settled on is a compromise solution where there's a slight violation for green light. And so with this, he was able to then build an experimental system and then simulate it where here's our diffraction orders and the intensity in each order for all three colors. And then here's the envelope on top of them. So I hope everyone can appreciate the green slightly off, right? This turns out to not matter so much. This small violation doesn't make a difference in the quality of the pattern at the end. 
But all of this came from just carefully thinking about the physics of this diffraction right here. Yeah? All, only on off, and interestingly, for the green light, we're actually using off. So the green is coming in at a different angle than blue and red. So we actually use the mirrors in the off position to generate the patterns for the green, and the mirrors in the on position to generate the patterns for the blue and the red. Yeah, so, so this gets rid of this entire blaze grading problem. So why wouldn't we do that? Because we want, we want it to go as fast as possible. So yes, you can, you can do this, but if you do that, you lose speed. And so we had a reason that we didn't want to do that. But yes, this is definitely possible to do this. You can also try and like corrupt the pattern. So you can intentionally introduce mirrors that are off the pattern that are on, that then have destructive interference with some of the problems you get from the blaze grading. There's, there's quite a bit of work done in this area. I'm not trying to say that we solved everybody's problems. We definitely just solved this very particular problem of not being able to model how light, polychromatic light was going to bounce off of this. So for each image, you're specifying three specific different angles for the DMD or just two? So for each structured illumination image, yeah, so for each structured illumination image, it's nine. So here, here they are. So, um, you know, so if we, you know, you put your laser glasses on and you run your phone, run your phone, then what you can see on the wall here is for each of these, you both change the angle and then you take three pictures at each angle. And so what you do is the pattern on the DMD shifts, picture, shifts, picture, shifts, picture, changes the angle, and then you switch the colors. And so that's what's going on here. And so, um, so hope also the other thing you can appreciate is there's a lot of just orders coming off this thing that are not very useful, right? So actually optimizing this system takes a lot of work and it's not that light efficient to be honest. So we end up having to use multi-mode lasers and a lot of effort to like homogenize the beam. So this is what those patterns look like. So each, each wavelength has a slightly different pattern, right? And so if you're used to thinking about things in unit cells or crystals, um, then, you know, these are sort of the conditions you end up with. And so because we have this extremely streamlined description where we can exactly model how these should show up and we do this in a full vectorial accounting, we can actually run this inverse model. So we can actually ask, given a pattern that we put in, do we get the thing back we should have gotten back when we look at the fluorescence? And so we can actually ask, how well is the instrument working compared to how we designed it numerically? So if you do that, what you end up with is three different model validations you can do. You can bounce your light in and put a camera at the Fourier plane of this. So then you see all these spots. So Peter's model actually exactly predicts both the location and the intensity of all of these spots for all of them. You can then trace this out, and so you can essentially look at the diffraction order intensity for experiment and theory. You can look at their position, and everything matches within about 1% from the way that we built it. You can then say, all right, now I want another transfer function in my system. So what you do is the DMD is now placed in a conjugate imaging plane, so it's conjugate to our object. We then shine these patterns in to a uniform, a slide of uniform dye, so it's like fluorescein, something like this. You then detect the fluorescence, and then you can ask, okay, so for a given pattern that I have in my Fourier plane, what do I expect to see at my camera? So this is what you actually get at the image, and then this is what you actually detect, which remember is blurred because we have the blurring due to the camera. And you can compare these, and you can actually directly extract the transfer function without needing to go through the effort of modeling the point spread function. So this is what that looks like. And so what we find for our systems, we actually get these points, and the, the actual theory for the system for just the objective should be this. So we're doing worse, but actually this is true for almost every high numerical aperture system that you do slightly worse than you should. So with this, we have what constitutes a complete forward model of the SIM system, right, where we now can really extract like what's noise and what's not. And so the last thing I want to say is all of the reconstruction code is also public. And so really, if you're interested in, in, in this type of SIM, the super resolution SIM, we've compared it to other groups. It compares favorably. So this is the exact same sample with an image with our instrument compared with our algorithm versus another group's algorithm that doesn't know anything about our instrument. It just tries to estimate the parameters from the data. And so these are the resulting images. These are the resulting reciprocal space. So you can see there's a slight difference in the band we rating, we reweighting. But the actual line cut of the data that's taken here is almost identical. And so we're pretty confident that this helps. So experimentally, what does this allow you to do? So we actually have this special slide that um, has these lines that are separated, um, starting at 330 nanometers all the way down to 30 nanometers. And so if we zoom in on the section that is the 120 nanometer, the 90 nanometer, and the 60 nanometer, you can see the wide field is pretty blurry. 
the sim, you actually start to be able to see it. And then there's this um, deep learning algorithm these guys published called sparse sim. So we were curious what it does. So it sort of punctates the data, but they claim that this makes it so you can see a line here that you can't see in the sim data. Again, buyer beware on these types of things. Uh, that does not show up well at all, so I apologize. I'll skip to the next one. So this is what it looks like in cells with multiple colors. So what we have labeled here in yellow are what are called mitochondria. Here's the powerhouse of your cell. And then in cyan, it's the actin cytoskeleton. So this is the structure of the cell. And so here is just a blow up. And so you can actually see, we can see these fibers and their crossings. And actually we had this conversation about sim artifacts earlier. So we definitely just sort of leave ours in because we're trying to be honest about it. So this is this dependence on the signal to noise I was talking about. This is not real, right? So this is one of these things you have to be really careful when you think about how it works and what are you actually doing? You know, what are you actually gonna try and biologically infer from this, whether or not it's real or not? And this is coming from that contribution of high frequency noise when we try and put the whole thing back together. And most likely this comes from this assumption about it being white noise versus it's actually probably structured noise, which means we're doing the wrong thing. So this is like an open area of investigation for lots of people in the field. Yeah, so the problem is it's out in this moray reweighted thing that we're down mixing into it. So the question is like, how do we know how that actually affects it? So I'm, if you have some suggestions, I'm super happy to talk more about ways to do that correctly. And then the nice part is this is a pretty photo gentle method. And so we can actually image these cells without, you know, basically killing them, right? Okay, so the second thing I wanna talk about really quickly uh, is just this idea of the, the sim is, Nice for getting super resolution, but it doesn't get us to 3D imaging that quickly. And so what I want to talk about is this idea of light sheet microscopy briefly. And so this is a, the original patent um, for the confocal microscope. And so for those of you that aren't familiar, the difference in a confocal microscope, instead of having a camera, you put a pinhole in here. This blocks out of focus light. Uh, Sigmondi actually introduced what's known sort of the precursor to the modern light sheet microscope, which is you separate the detection and the excitation pathway. This is a dark field instrument. But the idea here is he just took sunlight, brought it in this way, then he observed this way, and he actually looked at colloids of silver. People recently actually got to borrow one of his microscopes from a museum, put a camera on it, and they actually verified his findings that won him the Nobel Prize. So it turns out he almost exactly got the size and composition of these nanocrystals he was looking at correctly using this method. Uh, Zygmondi? Yeah, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for the colloid work, yeah. So, not the instrument itself, the instrument was part of it, yeah. Chemistry. It's chemistry, correct. Yeah, 1930, I think, and then the work was done, this the instrument was developed in 1902. So, people adapted this idea eventually to fluorescence, and so the idea is you bring a fluorescence beam in, you then illuminate only a few fluorophores, these emit, and then what you have is you have some convolution of your excitation beam and your detection beam. So this gives you optical sectioning. So the idea here is instead of having a microscope with one objective, we turn it to two, and by doing this, we get rid of out of focus light because we're no longer illuminating the whole section. So we can you know, go hopefully faster by imaging. The thing is most biologists still use confocal microscopes. It's because they're really used to them but also because, I hope everyone notices, there is a barrier between the cell and the microscope here. And in a light sheet microscope that's gonna look at a cell, it's inside the sample. It has to be immersed in there. And so this actually creates a problem for a lot of experiments. And to just be a bit more concrete, in a wide field microscope, you shine all your light, you collect your fluorescence. In a confocal microscope, you go to a plane, but you generate points, but both of these, there's a boundary. In a light sheet, you bring the laser beam this way. In the region where the beam is thin, so this is roughly twice the Rayleigh length for a Gaussian beam, you then detect emitted fluorescence that emits orthogonally, but you've broken this boundary. And so if you want to do things like keep your sample clean or do fluidics, this is very hard at this point because you've coupled these things. So light sheet imaging is an exploding field. There are like a million acronyms. And so selective plane illumination was one of the first ones. There's now light sheet theta, V-spim, di-spim, tiling spim. There's also lattice light sheet microscopy, which is really meant for high resolution cell imaging. This has a very small cover slip and then it, it does some special things with the excitation. But then there's another class of light sheets which are called oblique plane microscopes or scape microscopes. So Chris Dunsby introduced oblique plane microscopy, Elizabeth Hillman introduced scape. And the idea here is we're actually gonna 
play with the way the microscope works a little bit to only have one objective interfacing. And so what I want to do is take a second and describe that because this is what we've been working on. And again, the goal here is to get better 3D imaging than the sim can give. So let's see if this movie plays. Have people seen this optical illusion before? Yeah, okay. So the idea behind this optical illusion is the pig is not actually there, <laughs> right? So what's happening is a perfect refocused copy of the pig is there. If we turn this, you would see the tail of the pig if we turned it around. So the pig is actually living at the bottom of these parabolic mirrors, and these parabolic mirrors are actually satisfying this perfect imaging constraint, right? They're actually rebuilding all the rays back to exactly where they're supposed to go. And so what we want to do is we want to do that for high-resolution microscopes. But I told you earlier that's a problem because we violate this magnification, right? So we only match the sign condition. What we want to do is also match what's called the Herschel condition, where things are put back correctly on the axial, and we want to do those at the same time. So to do this, you have to think about what's the pupil function for a point emitter. And so this was all published. This, the, the images I'm showing here are from a picture by Botcher B. Wilson and Booth. Um, and so they just derived this in kind of the geometric sense. They asked, you know, if I have a point emitter that's emitting a perfect spherical wave, if I model my microscope objective as, you know, this perfect lens, what do I get? This was their approximation. They then asked, okay, how do I turn it around and make a perfect copy of what was here over here? So if you write the pupil functions for two microscopes down, it turns out that if the ratio of the magnifications of these systems equals the ratio of the refractive indices like we talked about before, you actually satisfy the perfect uh, remote focus between the object space of L1 and L2. And so you can actually just basically stack these two microscopes on top of each other. And the rule is the ratio of these magnifications has to be the ratio of the numerical, I'm sorry, of the refractive indices here. And then the numerical aperture of this objective has to be large enough relative to its refractive index to capture all the rays coming out of here. So if you have a high NA objective here, then you need a relatively high NA, NA objective here. So this is, was confusing the first time I saw it, but it's, it's a fairly really nice technique. And so if you do this, what you can then do is stack a third microscope on top of it and re-image this like you were actually looking at it over here. And if you do that, this is what a diffraction limited emitter looks like, plus or minus 80 microns from the native focal plane of where you think it should be. So if everyone can appreciate, this is nearly perfect, right? So there's almost no aberrations over 80 microns. This is easily the size of a cell, right? I mean, this is much bigger than a cell. If you were to instead put a camera here and just move the camera back and forth on your normal microscope, this is what it looks like. So this is just sort of classic spherical aberration, right? We have this issue going on. So why am I talking about this? So we have the normal remote focus that carefully matches the pupils and this you know, magnification refractive index. If we have our little cell here, right, we've got some features. We put this other microscope, we get an image that looks like this of this focal plane. That's, remember, the same as the pig. The virtual pig would be living there. So what if we wanted to do light sheet? Well, if we just tilted our laser beam by bringing a laser beam off axis so that it comes out tilted, then all we would have to do is tilt this objective to re-image that plane, right? The problem with doing this is these objectives are extremely close together, like 200 microns, to do this at high numerical aperture. So they just bump into each other really quickly. You can't actually get any distance. But aren't you canceling the aberrations by putting them back to back? You in, are. In a way? Yeah, so... So, ah, so if you tilt this one, it doesn't matter because you can look at this in any way you want. So you've, you're, you, remember this, you're imaging whatever happens to be here, and that satisfies both Sine and Herschel. So there is no aberrations in what lives here. It doesn't matter what you do with the third microscope. That's the beauty of this method. So Chris Dunsby proposed, well, let's just back the numerical aperture of this off move it a little further away, and then we just get a blurrier copy of what was inside the cell, but now we have light sheet imaging. Uh, ben Yang thought about this carefully, and he said, well, what if we put a little water prism here? I can exploit Snell's law and bend the light back in so I capture more rays, so he published this. We tried to build one. It was horrible to align. So then uh, Andrew York at Calico and Alfred Millet Seeking were talking with some of us, including Reto Fioco at UT Southwestern, and, this, and Andrew and Alfred proposed and built 
this objective, which is nicknamed Snouty because it's cut. And so what this is is a zero working distance NA1 air objective. And so what this does is it sits exactly at the focal plane of the secondary objective, and it captures all of the rays by bending the light in. What you sacrifice is you have more and more glass in these systems, right? So you do lose, fo you keep all of the high frequency information, but you sacrifice photons. And so, but what this means is actually we can re-image diffraction limited emitters with the exact same spatial resolution that we could if we just had the native microscope, but we can do it in 3D now. So here's what the instrument looks like. So we actually put a flow cell on top of it. This experiment is pretty much impossible with any existing high numerical aperture light sheet. So the lattice light sheet can't do this. The inverted lattice light sheet that Zeiss is now selling where they cancel the aberrations with a freeform optic should be capable, but no one has actually done it yet. Here's that remote refocus. I hope everyone can appreciate this is very close. My students really don't like aligning it. So it's like roughly 100 microns away. And then the rest of this is just laser launching and, and you know, dealing with the steering, right? Here's the proof is in the pudding. So here's what the point spread function looks like. This is XY, this is XZ. This is for our instrument. This is for a spinning disc using the same objective, primary objective we use. And we got someone to loan us a lattice light sheet just to show that it looks the same. So we're generating point spread functions that look very good. We can do this you know, at least 12 microns above the cover slip and nothing changes. It turns out this is actually true for about 60 microns above the cover slip. We just didn't put that in the initial publication. And the field of view is about 200 microns. So what we've built is a single molecule capable high numerical aperture light sheet that only has one objective at the sample. So this doesn't have the same resolution as the SIM I was talking about, but it gets us 3D imaging. And in our opinion, this is actually a bit better trade-off what we don't have is the beautiful forward model that we had in the SIM case. Actually, it turns out modeling this system fully off axis is a, still a work in progress and something I'd be very happy to talk some more about. This is what the optical transfer functions look like as you increase the, the effective numerical aperture of the light sheet. So what does that mean? As you make this section thinner, but it will diverge faster, you fill in more and more of that missing axial information but your field of view gets shorter, right? Because Gaussian beams focus faster and diverge faster when you increase their effective numerical aperture. And then the last sort of technical point I want to note here is that the data is tilted. <laughs> so it's skewed. So this is a piece of tissue, and each one of these little dots is one of those RNA I was talking about. So the raw data is actually a tilted plane. So it's a bit confusing to think about, and you actually have to go through a coordinate transformation to see it in the cover slip frame. This is expensive for big amounts of data. So what we've done in our lab is we've actually written a model that actually fits the raw data to know where single emitters are. So we actually fit in the native skew plane and we can do this on the graphics card instead of doing it uh, otherwise. And so again, in my lab pretty much everything is public because of the, some of the funding agreements that we have and we just think it's the better way to go. And so this code is also publicly available. This will actually fit any point spread function in any geometry. It doesn't matter if it's our system or not. So what's the advantage of doing it in this tilted plane, which is these gray boxes, is we don't have to reinterpolate it onto the red plane, so we're saving both time and data, right? Because the reinterpolation, I hope everyone can picture it, there's more red dots here than there are the planes. And then this is an image of uh, Frankie's flagella. So what he's actually able to do is image these at roughly 40 volumes per second using some fancy um, non-mechanical sc scanning tricks that we have. And then I hope everyone can see he can actually pull out the helical nature of this and actually start to fit this precession angle as this thing rotates around in the solution. And so he's in the process of finishing up the fluid dynamics for what he's working on at the moment. But this is actually something that we're able to do. So how do we generate such fast scans? We introduced a galvo mirror and we put it conjugate. And so what we're able to do is then remotely move the light sheet, which also remotely moves the image plane. So it's both scanning and descanning the fluorescence. And so with this, we can non-mechanically scan and basically go as fast as the photons allow us to go. These are happen to be very bright structures. And what I want to point out that's really critical is this is continuous, right? This is not an experiment that extended depth of field, single molecule, point spread function engineering is going to solve. Because this is a continuous object that we require to know this precession angle around. So any of these tricks that people play with trying to extend the depth of field of a microscope or change its point spread function are not going to work for this type of problem without a huge amount of computation. 
where we just natively image it and it works. And so we're really, really excited about this. And so the last five minutes, what I want to talk about is the thing that has gotten the biologists excited about this instrument. And so we're funded by both the Chan Zuckerberg Institute and the NIH to work on something called spatial transcriptomics. So what is this? So people heard of RNA sequencing? So RNA sequencing sequences all the RNA inside a cell. There's a movement to do this with imaging. So how does that work? So each one of these little squiggles is an RNA. You then bring in a bunch of biochemistry probes that then attach fluorophores to each of these that causes each one of them to be a different color, right? But you notice these two are actually the same color, even though they might be different. So you image all of them. You then strip all the probes out using chemistry. You just relabel them again with new colors. And then you start building up what looks like a barcode sequence. And so this is essentially communication theory applied to imaging. So like any good field, the acronyms are exploding. Um, we use this particular method called MRFISH, where what happens is multiple probes are attached to each RNA. We then bring a secondary probe in that has a dye molecule. We image that. We can then chemically cleave it and then do it for the next round. This is why we need that fluidic setup I showed everybody. We have to pump all the reagents in and out to do this. We, we haven't tried any of these methods. So then we get some code that corresponds to it. So what we're actually imaging is some piece of tissue where all these little um, black uh, lines I've drawn here are, are the biomolecule of interest, in this case RNA, and then each one of them that has it attached has the blue dot. And then you have this fluid cell, you have this objective. So why would you care about doing light sheet in this? So if you do wide field microscopy, you light the whole thing up, you've got a bunch of background, you start photo bleaching. How do you take 3D data? You move, literally move the sample up and down. Confocal microscopy, you have to raster the spot back and forth. Light sheet, oblique plane, we just illuminate the volume and then we just move the sample through the volume as fast as we can go and still, and basically you can do this at a constant speed. You can buy a stage now that actually will move at, let's you know, say like 400 nanometers every five milliseconds. And so then it's the same as just sweeping it. And so this is what it looks like. So we published this paper where we were looking at genes expressed in SARS-CoV-2. And so this is a piece of human lung autopsy tissue. Here's a 3D rendering of this little box. And what we were looking at are genes that are involved in the infection pathway, basically. And then particularly, we were looking for those cells that are a special class of cells that are called alveolar type 2 cells. These are the cells in your very distal lung. They secrete the surfactant that keeps your lung from sticking to itself when you breathe. So these are quite important, right? And these turn out to be one of the main entryways. And so um, the cells here with the yellow are those, and I, I hope everyone appreciate there's like ruffle. We can actually see the ruffle on the membrane using our instrument, right? So you can actually see the membrane wobbling. Then we can actually see the RNA, which unfortunately isn't showing up here. There's actually these little spots, like this red one's one of them, and then go through and count this thing. And so we were able to count this in like 16,000 cells. And, but the nice part is we can generate this data in like a couple hours. And so this is, you know, weeks better than they could do with their standard microscope. We can do this in what's called the olfactory system. So this is in the mouse. This is a mouse model of infection. So this is in collaboration with some people at CU Anschutz still. And then we can do it in pediatric brain tumors. And so this is proteins now, not no longer RNA. So here's a big piece of pediatric brain tumor. Here's this cutout. Here's the XZ projection, the YZ projection, the XY. And we've been playing with this group from the Allen Institute for Cell Science to do this fancy 3D rendering they call path trace rendering. So it actually tries to ask what's the local density of your point cloud and then render what it should look like. So here you can see the nuclei. You can see these pieces of the cell features. And so all of that has built up to these experiments we're doing now, which is the last thing I'll show, where this is a piece of human lung. If we grab this piece, what we can do here is, here's 16 different genes. You can see they're color coded by, waste, by where they're expressed. If we zoom in again, you can actually see that we have this you know, diffraction limit localization resolution. But more importantly, if we play this movie, we actually have it in 3D. And so we can actually ask, where are all of the individual puncta inside this thing with actual Z resolution, which is something that's been missing from most of the people who are trying to do these experiments. They typically capture these things in like two micron tish tissue slices, and this is a 40 micron piece of tissue, where each one of these color codes corresponds to a different gene, so you can actually see layering inside of this. So what then we do work with the biologists is we go in and we cluster these things together and we ask, what cell type is this? What cell type is that? And so we can go through and actually figure out the distribution of cell types inside these, these pieces of tissue. So this is mostly work by Rory and Lay from my lab. Okay. 
So hopefully, you know, I've shown you two applications of, of thinking carefully about, you know, what is the measurement you want to do in biology. And I think the big thing I want to take away is I really want people to stop using confocal microscopes if they don't need to for fluorescence microscopy. For things like two photon or, you know, harmonic generation, these are, you know, obviously it's still the ideal tool. But for normal fluorescence microscopy, it would be really nice if everyone starts thinking about, you know, ways that they can adapt these light sheet methods to move towards them. And in particular, because they enable experiments like this one, which just are not possible without other things, right? So you can actually start to ask fundamental questions about how these nanostructures interact with the fluid around them in 3D at very fast time. So this is why we're saying we're sort of capturing this stuff in action that we're not able to do otherwise. So all of this work was mainly done by uh, Lei Zhao, Peter Brown, and Roy Krudoff in my lab. The, the nanotube work I showed you was done by Frankie and Rizal. Um, the oblique plane microscope did not happen in a vacuum. So I, I saw, hopefully everyone saw everyone's pictures. A huge amount of credit goes to Reto Fioco for really pushing this forward and really thinking about the best way to actually align the instrument. So in his lab at um, UT Southwestern, they have a few of these now. Samples and sep samples prep came from CU Anschutz and from Duke. And then for the iterative fish, Jeff Moffat has been instrumental in kind of helping us get up and going on actually doing the chemistry because it's a non-trivial amount of chemistry of all this probe interchange. You know, and then we have sort of a variety of funding sources. And so um, we're at just about an hour, so I think I'll stop and then um, answer any questions. question. Wouldn't you get um, similar information if you were to place, uh, say, three objectives, one from above, one from the right side, one from the front, and look at the volume, and uh, then um, use the available information to construct the 3D? Yes. Object? Yes, you will. And, and it's been done. So why don't we do it? Um, because... We need the flow cell. I don't know if I did that or if the screen just. So we can't fit three objectives here. Uh, your biological sample has to. It has to live. So there's two pieces of glass that sandwich a sort of few hundred micron thick centimeter long biological sample. Right, so if we had a cell, you could think about doing that, and then you would just have to think about keeping it sterile. So if you had a living cell, you would immerse the objectives in there, and then you would keep that whole thing sterile, and then absolutely you could do that. So this is, I think people call this LSI light sheet microscopy, and so they've, they've tried to do this. They've actually combined it with SIM as well to, to do it even further. I totally agree. So, so there are a lot of what are called multi-view reconstruction, which is like the poor person's version of tomography, right? So you just have one or two, and so then you try and, and, and basically fill in a bit of that missing cone information that way. Absolutely, it's possible. In our case, it's because of the constraints of how we want to handle the samples that we've gone to this geometry. Yeah, but absolutely, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on how many photons you have. So, so if you have enough photons, um, you can run the DMD at 9,000 updates per second. There is no fluorophore that is going to give you enough photons to not have this noise-dominated issue, but... Is that 10,000 before after you've done 9,000? Before, 9,000 9, raw. Yeah, so why is it advantageous on the same setup you can also do optical diffraction tomography on the exact same setup. So with this, you can actually do optical diffraction tomography at a thousand. So you need about eight images is what we figured out in our setup to, to fill in everything you need to do ODT. And so we can run that at a thousand, thousand runs per second. And this is non-fluorescent, right? So optical diffraction tomography is a holographic method is sort of the quickest, dirtiest way to explain this. And so, but we have to recombine multiple views. So the beam spins around, but we can generate that spinning with the DMD on the exact same light pathway. So then we can be interrogating the sample to get its phase. 
at thousands of volumes per second and then switch on the sim when we need to. And so this is why actually the actual reason we like a big motivating factor why we went to the DMD and wanted the forward model was this experiment. So um, you know this is sort of what it starts to look like when you do that. You have phase information that shows you where different parts of the cell are, but you have no molecular identity. Right? There's no floor for in this to tell you what it is. So either some expert has to tell you that looks like a this part of the cell, or you have to then be able to layer on the fluorescence information. So we're not the first people to do this by far, but it will be the first multicolor sim version to do it. So this is the reason to go that way. Yeah. And actually the forward model helps with the ODT as well, it turns out. Having this full forward model helps with that. So but yes, so it's a lot faster, but typically you're 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 photon limited. So. And you mentioned the, the shift in the green, but I, I don't remember if you mentioned how you bypass that and why it doesn't matter that much in the end. The shift in the degree, sorry. In the green, right. Where oh, and so what it comes down to is, is this offset is in the electric field. Um, so, so it turns out once you square it to actually get to what the actual intensity is that shows up, it's not a big difference is what it comes down to. And so it, 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 does, it does bring the modulation depth slightly lower for the green than it is for the other two beams. So we do lose a little bit of modulation depth. So this is back to sort of your introductory thing, right? If we interfere these two waves, right, and the intensities are not quite balanced, we'll come up off the floor a little bit. So we do come up off the floor for the green slightly, yeah. But it's sort of acceptable with when where the reconstruction algorithm works. So yeah, we could if we could find a sufficiently powerful five five seven laser that's multi-mode that we can use, then that exactly matches the conditions. But for the five thirty two that we have, this is what we're living with at the moment. Yeah. So it depends on which experiment you're working with. And so the silicon oil objective that's in the light sheet that I showed, it's a 300 micron working distance. For this experiment, this is an oil objective, and so it's closer to something like 120 microns. So. Yeah, so I think if you want it to not, yeah, so the, the problem with the, the problem with the light sheet in terms of building a 3D volume is you need to sweep the whole thing before you can build a 3D volume, right? Whereas let's say you did light field microscopy or point spread function manipulation, you actually get that whole 3D volume at once. So theoretically your volumetric rate is actually higher for these methods that don't require you to sweep. But if you only need a little area because you know your sample's not going to move, then the volume rate goes very, very high, right? Because you're able to run this at the frame rate of your camera which in our case can be in the thousands of frames per second for this specific camera we're using. So then we could generate small volumes really quickly. Yeah, but the, the big disadvantage of this oblique plane is to yeah generate a full 3D. It's, it's got to go all the way over, right? So if it was sitting in one spot, then you could just do this and you would go a lot faster. So if we were interested in like one molecule's behavior, then that would definitely be a much better way to go would be to trap it. So, and actually for these nanotubes, this is a problem because they will just wander away. So you sort of start imaging and they're there, and then you know after three seconds it's, it's decided, just Brownian motion, it's gonna diffuse out of the imaging volume, and then you get to sit and you know, poor Frankie has to restart another experiment. So, you know, he's just, he, it's a bit of, yeah, if, if he had a more efficient way of trapping the molecule while letting it still do the Brownian motion he wants it to do, then I think he would be extremely ecstatic, because otherwise it's just a lot of effort on his part, so. Um, so I think for when we're calibrating it, that is definitely an assumption we make, is that we have a, a very, very thin, highly absorptive layer of, of fluorophores. For the, for the analysis, for the real experiments, the answer is no, we don't have to make that assumption. So what breaks down when you don't make that assumption? So for the sim, not that much goes wrong because what we're asking, you know, like in this case, you know, is 
can we maybe see what the interaction of these junctions are here? So this isn't really monodispersed in that case, right? For the, the thing where we're trying to localize the individual RNA, as they start to overlap more, then we don't know what they are. And so either we have to throw that away, or we have to start writing inference models that say, what do we think two spots that happen to be co-localized are going to look like on the camera when we see them? And then what the thing is, that's doable, but then every time you add that layer of inference sort of complexity, the computation time goes through the roof, right? And so one of our collaborators at ASU is actually really interested in these inference problems. But what I can say is it takes like a week for their model to run on like a 100 by 100 micron area. And so if you don't have somewhat separated signals, it becomes very difficult to find individuals. In this case where we're just interested in continuous features, we don't have to have that assumption basically. Yeah. But for the, the localization stuff, it's much easier if they're slightly separated. If, if you're not, then yeah, how do you count individuals at that point? It becomes a really hard problem. So we just cross our fingers and then deal with it when it's not. Yeah. But for dynamics, we don't care so Like for this type of stuff, we're not, like the movie here, you know, I would say this is not really that monodispersed for some of these things, right? I mean, it's maybe sparse in the way that, you know, it's not completely packed, but there's still some frequency information, so.